What's up, guys? So originally, I wasn't going to do a World Chess Championship recap, but this one was so interesting. The final game of the series. If you haven't seen it, uh, I'm going to explain what happened. If you have, I'm still going to explain what happened and give you my opinion and, and my take on the situation. So we're going to start at the beginning, look at the whole game very quickly and focus primarily on this key moment in the game. All right, so let's go back to the beginning. And I actually was asleep when this game was being played. So I missed most of the opening here, but this is pretty standard stuff. A lot of theory. Now, I don't actually know what was going on here. I don't play these lines enough to know if this is normal or, or what. Engine says it's pretty equal, but from a principle, you know, from a principled standpoint, this looks like a terrible bishop. Like this looks like it doesn't have any future, at least not anytime soon. And usually when you're putting bishops behind pawns, yeah, it's not, not always the greatest thing. And we're actually going to see that a few moves later, um, this bishop kind of gets just stuck back here, right? And not only is it stuck back here, it's, it's kind of blocking the rook from coordinating with the other pieces. You can't slide this rook over. The queen can't help this rook. It's just a weird looking piece. So I don't love that. You know, you look at Ding's bishops. They're both, uh, sorry, hey, bishops don't move that way. They're both doing a nice job. You know, they're where you would expect a bishop to be. So like I said, I don't know the theory enough to know if, if this is normal and something, what exactly went wrong. I don't know, but definitely doesn't look great for Jan here. Okay. That being said, position is still equal and he does a very nice job of kind of defending and getting ready to unleash the bishop. So if he can play c3 and at some point d4, all of a sudden that bishop that wasn't doing anything could actually become a monster along with the queen and, and get a nice attack going over here. So nicely done. And right around this point in the game, I think is where I tuned in and started watching it. Yeah, it was like right here, I believe, after queen g6. So, um, you know, Jan is basically saying, well, if my rook can't come over this way, I'm going to use it on the second rank and defend things this way. This bishop can move out of the way and this guy can actually become a defensive piece or maybe even an offensive piece here. And so that's kind of making use of the situation. Ding, the position looks great. I mean, look at how he's got his pawns set up. Total control over the center here. He's got this one defended nicely by these pieces. It's a passed A pawn, which could play a role in the future. This pawn is also doing a nice job of clamping down the center. Everything just looks really pretty. A lot of times in chess, if you set up your pieces so where they look pretty, it is, it's just good. It's just a good setup. And we can see that here. Everything is doing a nice job. So he brings the queen over. And whenever you see a queen and a bishop battery lined up on the king, you have to be really careful right? Because what he would like to do is push this forward and this is going to be checkmate. Okay. So very common type of battery to use your bishop and queen in this way. And uh, that's what he's doing. He's also at the same time has a battery here lined up on the pawn. Now, of course that's defended. So he's not going to be taking that right now, but he could play a move like E4 and maybe at some point there could be some pressure on this bishop. And so just a double battery along the diagonal and the file. Very nice move. I like that one. So G3, Really, you have to do something, and this is probably the best way to do it. So he blocks off that diagonal. Okay, so the rook comes over. Queen to f3, e4. So engine, for whatever reason, thinks white is doing okay here. But practically, this is a very logical move from black. It opens up the diagonal, uh, gets ready to open up the file, clears the square for the knight. A lot of good ideas. And... You know, recapturing here was probably the original intention, but after queen g2, somehow, somehow it's better for white, which is surprising. But what's happening is the position is opening up and those bishops, which were not very good, are now starting to become more active. And the queen is actually doing a great job of kind of defending the king over here. And then this rook, like that we talked about, might actually come over. You can see it's already doing a job there defending. But anyway that would have actually been better for white. Now here Ding finds a nice move. Instead of recapturing right away, he brings the knight in and starts putting pressure on these pieces here. So nice move there, queen back to g2. And again, sinks the knight in and the bishop now has the option to trade, but that's actually not a terrible thing for Ding because like I just mentioned, now the bishop is no longer bad. It's about to become a very powerful piece. And so we do get the trade and the queen comes in. And then we get, you know, some trades and Ding is kind of picking off some of these pawns, which looks good. But uh, at the same time, his king, we're going to see it here just a little bit, actually gets under some, some pressure. So let's actually go ahead. Um, he's defending the bishop. He's tucking the king over here. 
Jan's relocating the bishop to a, this is a nice thing to do a lot of times with your bishop. You put it where a pawn is defending it and it can kind of just sit there. You don't have to worry about defending it because the pawn is defending it. And it's, it's a nice square for the bishop. All right. Bishop here. And where's the, the moment? So right around here, let's see. It got pretty tactical. There's actually some tricky lines here. And okay. This was a good one. So let me, let me back up here. This is something worth talking about. So he takes the, the pawn attacks the rook. And then Jan plays rook to c1, which actually pins the bishop to the queen. And this is kind of annoying for black because you can't move the bishop or you lose your queen. You can't really move the queen to too many places. For example, if you just were to like randomly move it away, you're going to lose your bishop, right? Uh, also, the rook is, is being attacked, so you can't really do that. So the queen is kind of tied up, right? So he moves the rook away so that it's no longer, you know, under threat. And then queen to e2. The reason it's such a great move is because it's getting out of that pin in a very clever way. It looks like you're just giving up the bishop. But of course, if Jan takes that, there's a fork which picks up the rook. Okay, so that was a super nice find. It's not an easy move to find, you know, with a few minutes on your clock. Okay, so very nice move there. Queen to e2. All right. Bishop to b4. This was one of the moments where everybody was thinking he was going to play bishop d4. We're probably just going to get a trade, and it's going to be a drawn endgame. But Ding was thinking, no, why would I want to trade when I can keep both of these past pawns, right? Because two, I mean, even one past pawn sometimes can be enough to win. Two is very dangerous. Now, it's better if they're connected, but still, Bishop's doing a nice job of defending everything. And if you're thinking why well, can just capture that, there's a tactical reason. What was the reason? I can't actually remember. Uh, bishop to e1. Yeah, bishop to e1 would happen. And now white has a problem with this, this square. Um, you can't defend everything. Let's see. What's the reason? Because queen g2, bishop d2, the rook has to move. And I think basically what's happening is Black has positioned his pieces very aggressively. White is just totally on the defensive. And Black still has this pawn. And so because of that, it's just a very good position for Black. Not something that Jan really wanted to play. So instead of taking that, he centralizes the queen. And he basically is starting to just go for checks. Check. Check. And a lot of times in these kind of end games where your king doesn't have a lot of pawns left to defend it, the queen can just keep checking you. And there's really nothing that you can do about it. That's kind of what we were seeing here. Yeah, this was the moment. And everybody was saying it's going to be a draw. And I mean, you could see the Evo bar. Stockfish is saying it's going to be a draw. All the commentators were saying it's going to be a draw, right? But Ding says, no, I'm going to play rook to g6. Now, this was such a surprising move because he's stepping into a pin. Now, normally when you step into a pin like this, it's really, it's really dangerous for a couple of reasons. Number one, the rook can no longer move. It's it's pinned to the king. You literally can't move the rook anymore, even if you wanted to. The other thing is it kind of ties up the king, because if the king ever tries to move to get out of this pin, well, then your rook's undefended and white just captures it. Also, sometimes you can get out of a pin by moving your king like sideways in this scenario, but in this case, you can't because the pawns are there. So this is a very committal move by Ding. However, if we go back a few moves, what is his one major problem in this position that white is taking advantage of? It's that his king is has no safety. The king is it just keeps getting attacked, right? And so by playing rook to g6, even though he steps into the pin, even though it's dangerous, there's h4, h5 ideas, which we'll talk about in just a second, but he at least solves the problem of the queen can no longer check his king, right? Unless Jan is going to sacrifice the queen. There's, just, there's no way to get to the king anymore, right? At least not right away. You'd have to get the queen down here and somehow get a rook back there, and then you can come in from behind. Obviously, that's going to take a lot of moves to do. So he does solve his problem, and it's a very logical move from that standpoint. So congratulations to him. The other thing here, psychologically, at this point in the game, you could see that Ding was laser-focused, and he was trying to win. He wasn't trying to just, well, I guess it's just a draw. I guess we'll just have to see what happens in Blitz. He was like, no, this is the last game in the match. If I can win the championship right now, I'm going to do it right now. And so props to him, you know, to, to get those nerves under control and really go out and, and play for the win. And Jan here, he could have played h4, which is very dangerous for black because of the h5 threat. If this queen moves away somewhere and, and this happens, the rook is gone, right? Remember, you can't save the rook. So all you have to do is attack it with the pawn and you can just take it. So black would probably be forced to play h5 or at least keep the queen along this diagonal to guard that. And it's 
probably, you know, Jan's best chance. But he plays queen to f5, and then he plays h4. And basically, he got the ordering wrong. And this just goes to show how quickly a chess game can get away from you. I, I've got to believe that Jan was thinking, this is a, just a draw. I have checks, you know, even if I don't have the check. The, probably thought that this was not possible. Like all the comments, oh no, rook g6 can't be possible, right? And in that, those two moves here, queen f5 and h4, he just got the ordering wrong and he allowed queen to d3. See, if he would have played h4 right away, this same thing can't happen. There, there is no queen to d3 idea here for black. And if you play c4, it's just a free pawn. White's just going to take it, right? So by playing queen to f5 and then h4, he allows this. And this is such a good move. Why? Because it's doing one of two things. It's either forcing a queen trade, which Jan does not want to do, or it's forcing the queen to get off of the diagonal. The rook is no longer pinned. It's back into the game. And black has two pass pawns. And that's, you know, going to be significant. So, for example, if Jan takes it, um, this is just a, basically just a winning endgame for black. Like you, you've got two pass pawns, and you can't even really capture either one of them. Yes, you can, like, bring your rook over, but then black's going to bring their rook over. And you can try to bring your king up, but I think d2 and then a4. And if you come back, you're just not in time. a3 is happening, and you, you can't do this trade, right? Because... The pawn is too far, you know? So it, it was just too much for, for white to handle. So because of that, uh, Ding is winning. Like it's, it's basically over at this point, unless he makes a blunder. Um, and, and that was it. And it, that fast, the the game just got away from Jan. So um, yeah, he played on. He tried to get a little bit tricky here with the queen and the rook, you know, trying to, to infiltrate in the back here. All right, actually just accidentally closed the browser. I had to reopen it. So if they, the color looks different, it's because it's, <laughs> it's a new window. Anyway, right here, Jan tries to get tricky and come down with the queen. And he's trying to get the queen and the rook lined up along the back to go for a checkmate over here on h8, or at least force the king out where he can maybe attack it again. So rook comes over, attacks the queen, and sets up behind the passed pawn. As a general rule, that's where you want your rooks to be, behind passed pawns. And now... Um, Ding could have actually gotten away with this. C2 allowed the rook to come down, but it did get kind of tricky. And you can see there's a checkmate thread. It doesn't quite work because of the check, check. And then after this, black has queen C6. Now it's kind of tricky as to what exactly is going to happen after this because check. And then are there any more checks for white? It looks like there are no good checks, but that's a, you know a lot to calculate with only a minute on the clock. And so he decided to play rook to d6, which is the safer option. It's not as good, but he didn't want to allow the rook to come down and something crazy happened that maybe he missed. And so makes sense. He still has these two pawns, which is kind of what he was counting on to, to win the game. So Jan did play on and he tried to, you know, keep the queens on the board and get a little tricky, but um, it didn't quite work out. I think there was one chance that he had, yeah, right here he had one chance. If he would have sacrificed his bishop here, apparently there's some sort of like perpetual check. Like, if you push this, you actually white wins somehow. It's, I don't understand this. I guess there's checkmate. Yeah, there's queen f7 and, and checkmate. And I guess you can't stop that. And then if you push this pawn, let's see what's happening here. Again, bishop d4. And apparently this is... Somehow white is, is, is better or surviving this, the engine is saying. Anyway, Jan didn't see that. He had like 20 seconds on the clock. Uh, so no surprise there. Ended up playing this... Threatening checkmate, but that's pretty easy to deal with. And then Ding just kept pushing those pawns. And there was like one more tricky moment here. So Jan pins the bishop to the queen, attacks it with f4, but Ding just simply pushes here. Basically, he's saying, it doesn't matter if you take my bishop, I'm about to get a queen, right? So, for example, if this happens, he's just going to trade and get a new queen. Um, and yeah, Jan can't really do anything. This is the moment in the match. Um, if you watch Jan's reaction, he was clearly frustrated, kind of realizing that it, it's over at this point. And he, you know, he knew he had a draw um, and, and kind of messed it up after that rook g6. And so heartbreaking moment for Jan. Ding played it very well. And yeah, I mean, what can I say? He came out to play. He, he wasn't happy with just a draw. He was playing well. 
he kept his nerves under control and, and went out there and, and, and got the win. So congratulations to him. Uh, it was a great series. I didn't even watch all the games myself, but the ones that I did watch were very interesting, and it was close all the way, which uh, always makes for an interesting match. So I hope you guys enjoyed the recap, and um, let me know your thoughts down below. Um, new world champion. So, all right, see you guys next time. As always, stay sharp, play smart, and take care.